Uh, someone was calling out for help. So we uh, went down to the small boat and uh, at the time, all that we had heard was that there was a stabbing out in the Pensacola Pass. He gave us a little bit of information on the color and length of his vessel. Um, but other than that, we really, we went into it not knowing a whole lot. We grabbed our gun belts, jumped on the 29, our RBS-2, and I flew out of the basin. When I went out of the basin, as I'm heading out towards Pensacola Pass, uh, the boat was coming in through Pensacola Pass, coming right towards me. I didn't know exactly who that boat was at the time, but as I got closer, I had my guys uh, you know, pull out their, their weapons, not knowing what we were coming up against, and the guy, as I'm going out, he's coming by me, flying by me, saying, hurry, hurry, come to the station. The guy that was driving the actual boat to the station had been stabbed multiple times in his arms, and there was blood. Like, you could definitely tell there was blood everywhere. Um, they made contact with the individuals and determined that it was best that they just let them continue on into the station, um, and they escorted them back in. So when the, the boat moored up right here at our pier, um, I seen that there was a little boy, uh, I think he was eight years old or so, and I, he looked in shock. I, I grabbed him off the boat, um, brought him over here to the stairs, uh, and we, I handed him off to another shipmate, and she ended up taking him up the stairs. Uh, where she could contact his mother. By the time we got here, which was a matter of 30 seconds behind them, uh, there was already a trail of blood leading up to the building where Officer Har had uh, departed his vessel to uh, separate himself from the assailant. Me and another shipmate, uh, Seaman Black, uh, escorted him right here to the stairs as well. Um, and we sat him upright and started doing the necessary procedures to stop the blood loss. I have the guy elevate his arms, get that elevation, slow the bleeding. He's holding his arms above his head, crossed at the fingers, and my two shipmates have helped me hold the arms up. In this process, I have worked the t-shirt in there enough to where I've slowed it. And I knew I needed to find something finer to get in there. It was so high up in the armpit, there wasn't a lot I could do with what was on me. So I ran into the bosun hole and just grabbed the smallest line I could get a hold of and just didn't even cut it, just ran out of the door with it and just ran it up under the arm and tied as close to a proper tourni tourniquet as I could. And uh, we transported the individual who was stabbed over to um, one of the local hospitals. When EMS arrives, you know, they bring the stretcher over, help him on the stretcher, he's still responsive, obviously very pale, he's lost a substantial amount of blood. And we get him in the ambulance and I ride with him. It's a little goofy showing up to the hospital with a gun belt and pants and no shirt, but it was the only, what I guess, temporary gauze I had at the time for any direct pressure. We're trained to react to situations like this. You told me 10 years ago that I was gonna be reacting to a assault with a deadly weapon and saving a man's life by applying a tourniquet to his brachial artery. I never told you you're crazy. You know, I was, a, I was living in Waynesville, North Carolina, building houses. You never would have thought that. But the Coast Guard's training and the standard they hold us to is, is bar none, you know, the, the, there's a reason why we are the premier Coast Guard in the world. Please welcome tonight's awardees from Coast Guard Station Pensacola. Brian Gariano, Patrick Munaham, Nicholas Dezama, Jonathan Merrill, Katie Kravis, Michael Eisner, Dylan Collins, Aaron Black, and Bridget Criley.